Nagi is here, going to talk about actually one of my favorite things is cloud workstations. So this is going to be Kubernetes remote development with cloud workstations and scaffold in action. Take it. Good. Rest. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, who's sleepy here? No. Good. So yeah, I hope uh, for the next probably thirty-five minutes we can discuss a lot of things. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. So. Uh, I'm Imbe. I'm going to introduce myself with uh, uh, Today we're going to talk about Kubernetes Remote Development. Um, there are two technologies that actually come from Google. The first one is Workstations. Uh, it's actually recently announced in Google Cloud Next last year. And also Scaffold. Scaffold is an open source project uh, that Google has created probably several years ago to help uh, developers to work on uh, Kubernetes in the so yeah, I'm actually GDE. Uh, I'm actually software engineer from a company in Indonesia. So I recently moved to Baltimore and I fly all the way down from Baltimore to Boston for this event. And I'm working as, uh, I'm working in a group company named GoPay. So it's a payment company in Indonesia. Uh, and I'm actually working on development, developer experience team in cloud infrastructure. So, that's why all of my work are related to how to improve product, uh, developer productivity. So before we start, anyone familiar with Docker and Kubernetes? Okay, most of you. How many of you already running Kubernetes in production? Okay, quite a lot. So this is how we do typical development in Kubernetes, right? Uh, typically, uh, we have our computer, which is called local development. And then what we do typically is that we implementing features and then we run automatic tests and then we build the executable so that we can test it locally if you're building something like web server or api you're going to run it in your local give some input and then expect some uh, output out of the web server and then when you are done with one feature you develop another feature and then eventually you're going to push that to get repository and then when, when the code is being pushed the ci cd pipeline will start kicking in and then uh, it run automated tests, build the local image, and eventually that image will be deployed to Kubernetes. So that's how we typically do the development. And uh, there are several common development challenges uh, if you're using this approach. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, separate it into three different categories. The first one is about development and development setup. And imagine that you are running your application in Kubernetes. Typically, if people start using Kubernetes, they already have needs to uh, deploy their microservice application. So if you are using Monolith, you don't really need Kubernetes actually. And that means there are so many applications that you have to develop. And when somebody comes in as a new joiner, you typically provide them with some sort of documentation for their onboarding so that they can start setting up their computer and also that's uh, where he, he or she is able to run the application locally. And after that, after probably one or three weeks, they start getting into the code and start making real contribution to the features. The problem is it takes time. You need three weeks or two weeks uh, until three weeks so that people can start pushing their first commit to the kit. And then I think you can be better than that. Uh, the second problem is about cost of providing high-end machine because sometimes when you run so many microservice apps in your computer, you probably need more powerful machine. So that's why company end up spend uh, more money so that the developer can be productive by providing them like 3,000 or 4,000 uh, dollars machine and then it's not cost efficient and if the engineers leave before one year i think the roi is just very low and then even if you already have the high-end machine right it's still just one computer you cannot run your application in a distributed manner so what you have to do is that you're going to have to deploy it uh, to kubernetes but there is also a problem in that imagine that uh when you are when you're pushing the code, you're going to have to run the CICD pipeline. And CICD pipeline takes time. If your application is simple, it probably takes less than five, uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But if it's complex, I contributed once to an Envoy project. And then just to build the application, it requires more than 20 minutes. And it's not productive at all. And we don't want to waste our developer time in order to run the CICD. So that means that we also get our feedback slow, very slow. And uh, if you talk about product, about productivity as well, right? Uh, imagine like you are working in company, in a company, you have your computer, but your database that you need to use is resided in private network in the cloud, 
And in order to connect to that machine, you have to uh, provide the developer with some sort of VPN so that they can connect securely. Um, and there are a lot of things to, man to be managed in that case. And it's not productive because you have to spend more time to do maintenance or friction and that other thing instead of building features. And the last thing is the, a bit of So it's related to security. Uh, what if your computer gets stolen? What if your code, all of the uh, company uh, source repository are in your uh, local machine and somebody get access to that and then you basically have a code breach. And then we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to have this kind of situation. So that's why Google recently announced Cloud Workstation. So if any of you already do the comment on the cloud, so it's, the experience is pretty much the same. So what Cloud Workstation is that it's just a PM in the Google Cloud. Workspace, I think, I think some, some kind of thing, yeah, pretty much. Uh, okay, I forget. Uh, so, Cloud Station is actually a tool or a software that you can use in order to create an on-demand and consistent environment. So, imagine that uh, you have 10 developers. How to ensure that all of the 10 developers get consistent environment for development? So, that's how that's where you can ensure this with Cloud Workstation. And because most of us developers are familiar with uh, IDE like VS Code, in VS Code you typically have extensions. You can install Go extensions or probably Rust and many things. The Workstation is also comes with that. So uh, you can install Go extension when you already create the Workstation. And then you can do other all things that you typically do in uh, VS Code. And then if you want to test the application, uh, you can also directly uh, test it with dependencies in other VPC because now your machine is actually on the cloud. So what you need to do is just connect your VPC with uh, the VPC where the resources like database or third party API uh, are residing. So yeah, the next thing is about security. There are several uh, built-in security like Cloud IAM that you can utilize. Uh, the browser that you're seeing here is already a CTPS, so it's more secure. Uh, but the things that I like from the workstation is the customized development environment. What does it mean? So when you create a workstation, you have to specify a configuration. The configuration will tell a uh, cloud workstation about how the VM should be created. But the most important thing is that you provide it as a Docker image. So you give them the Docker image and then it will create machine based on the Docker image. Because we all, we all of us probably have been using Docker uh, right, so and then it's will it will be easier if we can uh, do it that way. So our workstation is actually part of software delivery shield. But if you're talking about uh, this thing, the delivery shield, it consists of several things like develop, supply, CI, CD, and runtime. But workstation only uh, uh, is only part of the development side. And then this is uh, the solution coming from cloud delivery, uh, delivery shield. And uh, if you see here, this is where we start the development. And then we start a CI CD pipeline and we put it in the artifact registry. Eventually, the application will be deployed either to Kubernetes, Cloud Run, or any other type of platform. Uh, this is how you're going to configure workstation. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate it to you later. But uh, there are several terms that we need to know. The first one is about workstation cluster. Cluster is just a logical group about your nodes. So the cluster will tell you that. Uh, the VPC, the, the workstation that we'll be using, something like whether you have a uh, private VPC or which subnet uh, that is and so on and so forth. And then once you have that uh, cluster, you can create one or more configuration. So if you see here in the first configurations, uh, you can specify the IDE that you want to provide for developer. In this case, it is uh, IntelliJ. Okay, and you can also define the machine spec for that configuration. Let's say you, because you know that Java takes so much memory, right? You probably want to. I see somebody. Uh, we know that Java takes so much memory, so we will provide them with high memory instance. But if you're using Go, probably you don't need that uh, high memory, so you can uh, provide with a different configuration that use probably GoLand and probably lower. Uh, CPU spec and memory spec. And then for each configuration, you can also tell uh, the workstation who can create workstation by using that configuration. So you can define, let's say you have group of Java developer, Go developer, and so on. You can assign permission directly to those groups. And then once you have configuration, 
you can just uh, create a workstation by using that configuration and it will instantly create you a new machine that you can directly use. This is a bit, uh, a bit about architecture. Uh, if you see here, uh, the security uh, when the security that we can utilize when we are using workstation is more on the IAM side. So you can provide uh, roles to the user so they can create workstation, they can remove it, they can manage it and so on, or probably provide them with uh, Docker-based image that uh, you want to use. And eventually it will be residing in the VPC network of Google. So it's just a VPC. So if you have resource in other VPC, you can just use VPC peering or other type of connectivity methods. And then your workstation, because you provide them as a Docker image, right? When you create the configuration, there will be a new VM created with that Docker image. And you can also have a persistent disk so that when the VM is stopped, probably uh, at night because you are not using it for development, you can keep the disk and then use it later tomorrow. So let me go to demo. I think, uh, yeah, this is the this is the UI, so Cloud Workstation. So this is the cluster that I mentioned earlier. So I already have one cluster. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, showing us that uh, where this cluster is located, US Central, what the network that is using, subnet, and so on. And that's it. That's it for the cluster. <coughs> And when you already have cluster, you can create configuration. Uh, let me see what we can specify on new configuration. You specify the name, and then where uh, this config can be used, which cluster. And then you can also uh, define uh, several uh, things about how to set the cost. So if you want uh, if you want to have lower cost, probably the start, uh, startup of the machine will take a bit longer. Uh, you can also define the pool size. And after that, Wait, let me just choose one. And after that, uh, you can define which uh, machine that you can use. Uh, there are several options. You can choose whether you want to have higher memory or uh, low memory. Uh, just FYI, if you use uh, the smallest type of instance now, if the cost per month for a developer, assuming that you work eight hours a day, it will be around 40 US dollar per month for one developer. So you have to book it for the whole month or is it per hour? Per hour. But if you're using consistently eight hours a day for, let's say, 20 days in a month, right, it will cost you around 14 uh, bucks. So one thing about that. Um, we're, just, we're currently in the preview period. That's right. So I think currently the only costs you're incurring yes. are the cost of the VM That's storage. Right. But there will be like a control, control pain costs that will eventually come when they, when they make this product GA. And so I don't think we know really. Yeah, I think the that, price is not there yet. Yeah, so. I haven't announced what the control plane cost is. So there is a persistent monthly cost to have a cluster. And then there's a per second cost for using a workstation. Exactly. We don't quite know what it is. I never use GitHub Code Workspace, actually. This is a full container. You can run whatever you want. That's right. I would say you can run whatever you want to run. GitHub Code Spaces might be more analogous to the cloud shop. Which is like it's just a shell in the browser, you don't have any real control over it. This is like flash on where so you can control which region, which VM, exactly what runs in the operating system. It's like a DPI now. It is that. Yeah. It's exactly that. Exactly. And, and this it's running something else, right? Yeah, uh, it actually depends on uh, the image that you're using, but I believe they have support for Linux, but I'm not sure about Windows. But I think they have support for Windows. I need to check the documentation. Uh, yes, please. So, what's the question? You don't take it. Oh, Good part. Oh, okay. It's worth looking at. Yeah. I think part of what Google 
So let me follow, uh, continue the demo first. Uh, yeah, this is the machine part. You can probably define several um, config for cost saving as well. And then uh, there are several advanced configuration. You can also do encryption if you have some sort of requirement for your system because probably some highly regulated company has that kind of thing. So you're gonna have, you, you can specify encryption and also uh, you can provide your uh, custom encryption fee as well. And then after we complete this, I think this is something that I uh like okay i'll go to that so yes so yeah if you have a local file uh what you're gonna do uh because we are we want to create uh something like a consistent environment for developers right so typically what will be inside the workstation will be something that will be needed by all of the developers so say that if you have a file that you want to put into workstation and it applies for all developers you probably can define it in your docker file so that how that's how you're going to do it so you put it inside the docker file or you, you can create a script that will pull that file okay. oh, yes. Is that applies for all of the developers? Okay, let me finish the demo and then you will be able to see how what interface that you might have later. Okay. Probably it will answer your question. So uh, you can define custom container. In my case, I already create a custom container, a custom Docker image, uh, which install Helm into that so that we can do deployment later with it. But if you just use base editor for code RSS, uh, it doesn't have Helm installed on that, so you can configure any software that you need for your uh, if you want to install info you can also do that by providing a docker image that has info installed and this is a disk configuration uh, this one this one no 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 okay so this is something that I would like to show actually. Uh, during my time as developer, this is something that really bothers me because I have to find the value for all environment that I need. So if you uh, configure the environment variables that you need for your, all of your developer, you can just configure it here. And then once they run the workstation, they will be able to use that directly. So uh, this is something that I find really useful uh, in our current workflow. And once you have this configuration, right, you can just create a new workstation by giving the configuration itself. And then because I already have one here, I'm just going to launch it directly. So what you will see here is just a VS code, but it is in the browser. And I already have uh, GitHub connected to this, so it's just uh, the matter of uh, GitHub authentication. So you can pull the code from GitHub or probably in other rep uh, repositories, you can also uh, do some sort of authentication for uh, SSH, something like that. And then you can uh, have extensions like what I mentioned earlier. You can install Go extension and any type of extension that you typically use locally. And then once you have this, once you have your code, let me open the code. It's pretty much the things that you get. Uh, this is the code that I already pulled, and then I also have terminal. So the question is, if I have file that I want to upload to this machine, what should I do? I just probably can pull it by using gcloud command and then put it inside the VM, if it's just specific for my case. But if the test, test data that you mentioned earlier is valid for all developer, all developer probably need it, you probably will create a script so that the data will be pulled when the workstation is created. So that's kind of automation that you can do. Uh, this is about workstation. This is pretty much, uh, I'll go back to the slide. Uh, we'll, cont we'll continue later with scaffold. But after, even after we use workstation, right? Uh, there are several problems that is not solved yet. Even when you're using workstation, 
you don't have a similar environment like what you have in production. You are not running your application in Kubernetes yet because you just have one VM and still it's a single machine. And then it's still hard to get feedback about changes and CICD still takes time because when you do development from scaffold, sorry, from workstation, you're going to have to push and then wait until CICD uh, is completed. And then what we can do, how we can improve this. So instead of doing uh, testing and uh, debugging from local development, why don't we shift our uh, the way of work into deploying directly to Kubernetes from our local? We can skip a deployment by using CI CD until we, until we are ready, that our code is actually tested and it works as expected. So when we developing features and we run automated tests, and then we probably want to run application directly on workstation. You, uh, uh, yeah, the cycle is pretty much similar, but the differences is just this part, run and debug application in Kubernetes. How to do it in naive way? You can create a script, deploy local SH, you build the Docker image, Docker build, you push it to some sort of registry like VCR or probably Docker Hub. And then once you're done with it, you probably want to deploy your application. You run kubectl apply, uh, minus F and the manifest YAML. And then once you're done, the application is deployed, you want to test it from local. So you do kubectl port forward, and then you have a port in your local so that you can just directly test it. But what if you, if you want to check the log? You run kubectl log and then the log will be streamed into your local computer. This is the naive approach. But there are a lot of things that you have to do every time you uh, do it. And uh, there are problems remain for this approach. There are a lot of ways and uh, end up in your, probably in cloud or probably in your machine and so on. Uh, let's take example like Docker build. When you do mod code modification, Docker will create a new layer of image, right? And then the image will end up uh, consuming your resource, your disk. And that's something that we don't want. Uh, if you're using something like GCR, probably the cost of GCR will keep increasing if you are not maintaining that, if you are not doing a frequent cleanup. Uh, and if you do development directly to Kubernetes, when you deploy your application, you probably forget to clean it up. It's okay if your developer is just one or two people, but what if your developer is 100? What if the 100 developers forget to remove that uh, unused deployment? What happened? You end up having high cost because no one wants to really remove that because they are not sure whether it's important or not. So that's something that we want to solve by introducing Scaffold. So Scaffold is actually a tool that helps you to optimize source to Kubernetes development. Uh, what does it mean? You have Scaffold in your uh, machine and then when you run Scaffold, Scaffold will do something like uh, file, uh, file checking to check whether there are any changes or not. And if there are any changes detected, it will run the entire pipeline to deploy your application. Once it is done, it will clean up everything. So you don't need to worry about whether you uh, have some leftover that you forgot to clean up and that kind of thing. And then uh, you have seen the script that I showed earlier. Uh, it's about... It's open source, but it's originally coming from Google. So Scaffold is also the technology that is used for Google Cloud Deploy. Uh, so for the continuous feedback, right, uh, once you run Scaffold and then the application is deployed, Scaffold will actually uh, port forward the pop into your local machine and then also stream the log directly. So you don't need to run more comments in order to check the log, uh, doing a call from your local and that kind of thing. So the interesting part is about enables live debugging. So some of you probably have experience configuring uh, live debugging for container running in Kubernetes or something like that. And Scaffold also can help you do that if you have proper configuration. But I'm not going to demonstrate it today because I think there are a lot of things in documentation. I think it's better for you to check it that out. And then uh, if we are working with Scaffold, uh, there will be manifest YAML that we need to prepare. We're going to go into that later. But Scaffold is actually a lightweight client just running on the client side. So there is no something nothing that you have to install in your uh, Kubernetes cluster is just on your machine. In our case, it's in workstation uh, node that we created. It has support for multiple build and deployment tools like Git, Wheelpack, Docker, Helm, Customize, and so on. And the most important thing is that it has ID integration uh, as an extension for VS Code and IntelliJ. So the name is Cloud Code. So how does it work? Uh, like I mentioned, it has file synchronizer that will detect changes. But 
if you don't want to have deployment every time you uh, press command S to save the file, you can also change it to on-demand basis. So uh, once you deploy it, it will build the artifact, run the test against the artifact, check it automatically for you. And then uh, because during the development, you specify what manifest that you want to use for deployment, right? It will also use that manifest render it and then deploy it to the Kubernetes cluster. And once it is deployed, it will tell the log port forward. And when you are done, it will be cleaned up. So that's how we can uh, remove a lack of from the clusters and probably in our computer. Because if you end up running Docker build every time you test, right, uh, you will uh, consume more uh, disk space on your computer. And when the problem comes, we actually forget. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. Okay, let me show you the demo a bit. So this is the demo. So uh, let's go with the scaffold YAML first. So I actually have a file that I use for Cloud Run Hackathon uh, I think last month. So uh, there are a lot of files, but that's not something that I would like to demonstrate. So uh, I have a scaffold YAML. Uh, this is the config file uh, that you're going to use uh, in order to tell scaffold YAML. Uh, let me go to the file. So you can define several profiles that you want to use. You can use something like development, staging, and production. And then in in my case, I just have two profiles. The first one is Helm profile, and the second one is Kubernetes. So what this profile does is actually uh, it uses Helm to deploy the application. And for the Kubernetes, it will use the manifest uh, of Kubernetes, the native Kubernetes manifest to deploy the application. And apart from that, you can also specify how the application will be built, how Docker image will be built, uh, whether you want to use Google Cloud Build or just uh, build it in local. So uh, this is how you're going to use Scaffold. And actually, if you want to run this, you can just uh, use Scaffold that command. But uh, I think the easier way to do that is by using the cloud code extension so uh, when you are using a base image provided by google cloud scaffold is already installed in that so okay yeah so uh let me go to this a bit i have a deployment folder where i provide several way of deploying this application because in this profile, I'm using Helm, right? I'm using Helm. I just, I need to provide the chart path. The chart path is, uh, is here, actually. This is the app, uh, chart that we're going to use. Uh, there is a, some sort of value, and then there is a template for deployment. And then uh, if I don't want to use Helm, let's say I want to use Kubernetes manifest uh, directly. I can also do that. Actually, this manifest is generated from the Helm chart, so it's actually the same. But uh, in this case, I'm using a uh, native way in order to deploy application. But you can configure that in uh, Scaffold. You can provide whether you want to use Helm and KubeCTL manifest and what manifest that you want to deploy, what image that, uh, sorry, what chart that you want to use, whether it's uh, in your local or whether it's running on uh, its store in uh, cloud, something like that, remote repository, that kind of thing. You can also define the namespace. So pretty much all of the configuration that you can have in Helm CLI, it is provided here as well. So, no, no, it's not, we're not uh, doing anything with Terraform. We're just deploying the application, so we don't need any Terraform. Oh, this one you mean? Yeah, this, this is something different. So, oh yeah. Uh, so uh, this Terraform is actually I use it to deploy the application to uh, Compute Engine. So for this uh, talk, it's not actually real fast. Yeah. Uh, what? Do you, which one? 
Uh, no, no, no. Uh, all of the code that I wrote here uh, is just by myself. It's not automatically generated when you're using no, Scuff. Go back to the, to the yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because we are deploying an application. Right? We are not creating infrastructure. Yeah. So. No, no, it's, it's, it's totally different. You, uh, if you want to create VM or any resources in AWS, you can provide Paraform modules, right? But this is not something that I use uh, for uh, WordPress and Scaffold demo. But I have this so that I can deploy the same application to the compute engine. So it's actually different talk. But I, because I just use one repository, so I put all of them on the same repository. So yeah, uh, this is pretty much uh, the code topic. And actually, the rest will be the same. You will have Docker file. Where is it? This is a Docker file, a simple Docker file. But if you want to enable like debugging, you're going to have to install something like VLC so that you can configure the remote debugging and then tell Scaffold uh, where, which port to use. And then what I'm not doing it now, uh, what I'm going to do now is that I will just go to Cloud Code and then run it directly on Kubernetes. So if you see here, I already have Kubernetes cluster connected, but nothing is installed now in Kubernetes. So when I run this, you will see that uh, Scaffold will uh, be initialized. See here, and then it will run command like Scaffold that, which is used for development. And then it will start building the container because I already built the image before, so we already found it remotely. And then it starts deploying the application by using Helm. Oh, uh, wait, let me check which profile that I'm using here. Yeah, we're using Helm. So this application is actually deployed. What of stuff for Kubernetes is ready. And then if we see here in port forward, it's actually port forward the port from the surface to your local. So if I test it, uh, local host IP80. I will start seeing response from the API. But if I want to check what lock is uh, coming, I can also go to this lock and see that the lock is streamed to my uh, terminal as well. So uh, this is uh, scaffold. But I told you, right? What? How to get faster feedback if you do development? It doesn't make sense if we have to kick the CI/CD pipeline and then start the pipeline from the beginning just to test whether the small changes that we did is actually working or not. So that's where Scaffold is actually coming in. Uh, let me change a bit. Uh, in this case, I have two statements. The first one is for debugging, and this one is for printing the output. I will change both of them. Just add two, or I will add uh, Scaffold demo in Boston. I will do the same Scaffold demo. So. If you see here when I save it, um, there will be a process be executed here. So Scaffold will try to rebuild the image by using changes that we recently saved. And then once it is done, once the build process is done, I'm currently using the Google Cloud Build, so we're gonna need to take uh, we're gonna need to wait. Once it is done, we will try to call again and then see whether the response is changed or not. So at least uh, what you can say uh, from using Scaffold is actually the time. So you can directly deploy to Kubernetes without really have to maintain the complexity of running your Dash script. Uh, if you run to have, if you have to uh, run probably several scripts or several comments, you don't really have to do that. And once you are done, you don't really need to clean it that up. And then uh, let's wait. It's going to take a while, but I can take questions if you have. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I kind of get the same feedback. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, I think I got uh, the same feedback uh, recently. They said that why GCP just release it now, while other provider already did that probably a long time ago. I don't know why they just did it, but I think uh, this is something that will help us working in a big team. So I'm working on the developer experience, right? I need to find a way how to help the developer to be productive. And because we already in GCP, so that's why we try to see uh, whether this technology might fit our use cases or not. So we kind of uh, play around with it and try to think what needs to be added on top of this. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think the way we see it as uh, the developer experience teams uh, compared to the developer is a bit different, right? So from our uh, point of view, we probably need to help them to have less context about the technology that we are using, uh, whether it's Kubernetes, Docker, because in our company, we don't really expose the developer how to build the image. We just need to provide us with this, and then we build everything and we deploy everything. That's how we work. But in sometimes the developer wants to know more about it. We also want to tell them this is how we do it. But most of them probably doesn't really care about what we do. What they care the most is just how they can ship the feature faster. So that's why we are exploring many things, and this is something that we are trying to. See. I believe so, but I haven't installed it yet because it's a. Uh, there isn't a co-pilot plugin for, for Code OS Atlas, yeah. but if you use any of the commercial ones like the PyCharm or GoLand, they have um, GitHub co-pilot for that. I see. So using the native open source in browser editor, no co-pilot, mm. any of the supported yeah. proprietary ones. I see. Yeah. Maybe I, I hope I didn't get it wrong. So you have the option there, right? You have the icon and you have the proposal by you don't have to get a stuff on it, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Like, so what is in that computer image is the theme that runs the Python server. You connect to that, it's going to be a favorite Python. So I am a Python professional to go to GDE and I pay nothing to Google for that image. But my paid license with PyCharm is what I use to connect to the server. So if I don't have a PyCharm license icon, you won't want to use the PyCharm image. You'll use the photo as that image with the free browser editor. And you could connect to VS Code. So one thing I don't know if you mentioned is like those work can they are SSH accessible. You can connect it up with a what is it called? A agent or something like that. So uh, SSH into it, and then you can use whatever anything you want. So I just use code to run on my local machine, connecting over SSH to the workstation. Yeah, it's pretty much the same if you have a VM running and then you directly do uh, remote development, yeah. remote code. If I'm not mistaken, the term for the VS code, but yeah. So let's try call again. Uh, so looks like uh, if you see it's a bit changes. Uh, previously, we have not checked that, and now I checked done with uh, empty uh, white space. Why? It's because probably I pressed Control S before, before I uh, before I so that's why directly deploy these changes. But I think uh, oh no 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 no, it's it's a C here, it's a C. It's here now. So the changes is actually already reflected after you uh. Run the scaffold again. Scaffold run. The question is, you know, the actual right people are using to build on this old space. We've got one of the other, so, especially the public. That's right. Can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. You can do the similar thing, but uh, I didn't uh, have demonstration for that because, yeah, because I uh, in Go, right, because it's a compiled language, it's kind of different with other language. Uh, you gonna have to set up something like DLV server so that re so that uh, tools like Scaffold know how to uh, jump into breakpoint and stop it at a certain breakpoint, that kind of thing. So but have uh, you have to install at least uh, because this is Go app, right? Uh, for Go, you have something like DLV. 
uh, that you can use to um, run uh, remote debugging and then you add it to your docker file and then run it uh, and then run it as a server on your application and then it will some somehow like uh, forwarding the request to the application so that's pretty much so actually google cloud also mentioned about it this is how you're gonna specify the command in this case let me go here i'm using ng point for just directly triggering my app but if you want to use the LTU for enabling remote debugging you're gonna have to change the docker file a bit so you're gonna have to provide a docker file for development and after that uh, you specify the port here probably 1234 and then you tell scaffold which port that you're gonna use for remote debugging i'm sorry Enable for which one? The scaffold? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, if you run scaffold mode, once you stop the command, uh, let me show you. Yeah, I haven't demonstrated yet. So let me stop this. This is a stop button that will stop the scaffold. And then everything will be stopped. And then if I check the port, Oh yeah, how how uh, scaffold know uh, when it should do the thing? So uh, the answer is when you pop the scaffold CLI or port code plugin. So I just did it by pressing a stop button right here before, and then once I stop it, everything will be cleaned up, including Docker images uh, that I have locally if I use local build mechanism. But now, because I'm using Google Cloud Build, uh, there's no way that you can do for now because it's actually open issue in Scaffold. If you use uh, Google Cloud Ministry to store image from Scaffold, you cannot uh, automatically delete that. So it's a limitation. So you're going to have to probably provide with some sort of cron job to clean that up. Uh, because I think if you want to use this for development, you're going to have to provide something like a uh, dedicated project, right? A dedicated project or cluster just for development. And then if you know which resources need to be cleaned up, you can just automatically uh, execute it. I think that's it. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I think that's it uh, for the scaffold. Uh, after we did scaffold demo, all of the problem here should be solved, hopefully. Uh, yeah. I'm in Twitter, uh, Imre Nagy, I think that's the best way. I'm active. I actively, I actively took in Twitter, but I'm sorry if sometimes it's not so fun. But yeah. Is there any questions? Otherwise, I think, yeah. Uh, you mean, will it be possible to use Kubernetes robot? Uh, yeah, it, it is possible actually. If, but you're gonna have, uh, you will have to automatically run the command in your VM. kubectl, what's the drawback, something. Uh, actually, yeah, that's a good question. I think the, uh, in scaffold, you, I'm not really sure how it works internally, but I need to check that out. Uh, the question is, uh, if I want to roll back, which image that will be used for the rollback? Because in scaffold, the, uh, the limitation now, I'm not sure whether it's limitation or not, but uh, the thing that I'll observe that if you do deployment, it will use the same tag for the deployment. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way. But I think if you do rollback, right, uh, if you do rollback with Helm, if the image stack will be the same, it will just point to the same code. Because, yeah, if the, if the base image is different, yes, but if the image version is the same, there's no way to go back because the new image stack is already there. Yeah, it's already replaced. But I think uh, because we are just doing remote, develop, uh, remote development, right, so we, we can just directly change the code and probably roll back the previous commit and then redo it. That's really how you do it. Yeah. In general, even I run scaffold locally. But the, the things that I want to demonstrate is that you don't need uh, your local computer anymore. 
in order to do remote deployment for Kubernetes because you already have a workstation in the cloud and then scaffold on that machine. So you just directly run scaffold. Yeah. Yeah. What I need is just browser. I don't need to move to my Mac anymore. I can just use my iPad if I want, something like that. Uh, for my case, I think it's less than three minutes actually. But uh, you mean for the rollout, right? Uh, yeah, I mean it's because I think the the things that expand is actually the image build. It, by default, when you save, it rebuilds. Yeah. So it'll be instantaneous. If you want, you can have it wait until you rebuild. But then the the length that it takes to rebuild just depends on what you're doing. If I post a wing, it's still a What do you mean by wait? Uh, tell it to wait. Well, if, well, let's say I don't want to rebuild. Okay. So, Yeah, I think three minutes, sorry, three minutes for just building the image. But if you, uh, what I mentioned earlier, if you don't want to redeploy every time you save, you can just disable this. So, uh, scaffold will stop working your changes. What, but what you have to do is just uh, trigger it directly from the cloud code. So, you have to press this button every time you want to do redeployment. Do you still have time? I don't know. I, I don't have any request that I want, but I think I, what I need the most is about how uh, something like documentation that can help me to understand how I should uh, configure the base image for this kind of thing. So it's more like uh, tell us what is the best way to do so, because actually when I prepare a custom image for this, I take so, so much time to understand how it will uh, build the image, how it will get created. Uh, uh, when we create the uh, configuration, we can specify the service account. The question now is where this service account will be used, whether it's going to be used when we create the VM or when we execute uh, the preparation for that VM itself. That's something that I find interesting. So I think I don't need any other feature right now, but I like to have more clarity in terms of that. Because now, if you see here, I can also connect my G Cloud account. Uh, the question now, why do we need the service account? That's something that's not clear to me. That's right. No, it will clean up once the scaffold is stopped. So if you run it 10 times, uh let's say if you did add modification after you start the scaffold it will keep the image there but when you stop it everything will get cleaned up okay i'm not sure i'm not sure yeah i'm just curious like uh it's actually using kubernetes crd format Nope. I use uh, reference that in your manifest YAML. So you mean something like CF CPU or memory, right? Yeah. yeah. So you uh, specify it here because it's specific for your time. So you have to know 
what is the resource required to deploy an application. You just need to know which manifest to be deployed. Right. Yeah, that's a question. Good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you so much. Thank you.